Okay, everyone, welcome to our seminar, which is the last of this this year's academic year's uh, seminars. Uh, uh, so thank, thank you for, the, for turning up today and also for turning up uh, in various bits of, of the whole series. And we have a whole new series starting in late September and carrying on. They've already got a really exciting range of speakers lined up uh, uh, for, for those months. Uh, and again, we've got a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Sebastian Stiebel, who is visiting us for a couple of weeks. He, he's been here for the last few weeks. He's leaving tomorrow. And he's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And uh, he's he did his uh, undergraduate degree and his PhD at the University of Bayreuth in Germany. And a lot of that work has been on atolls. And he's been thinking about atolls for, 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 for quite a while. And we'll share some, some of his ideas and thoughts about that. So thank, thank you for presenting to us. Over, over yeah, to you. Thank you. All right, um, I can give a few seconds. Yes, people come in. Um, yeah, so thank you, Yadminder. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, I'm very excited to be here and speak a little bit about sort of the system that I'm very excited about. And um, just, I'm, I'm very happy to present to you very in a very broad sense, the ecology and also the conservation of atolls. And this work is basically bringing together two major pieces of work that I've been writing. One is a, a big review on atolls that's going to be published later this year in annual reviews that's sort of looking back at all of what we know sort of about atolls. And then the second bit, the conservation bit, is an article um, that we've written um, that's more looking to the future, um, well, how we think we should approach atolls um, beyond this very fatalistic narrative um, that we have about, about these systems. Um, but to begin with, I really just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. When, when I speak about an atoll, I mean these large circular or ring-like structures in the tropical oceans, and they really comprise three major subsystems or three components. We have the coral reefs that form these more or less continuous rings. On top of these coral reefs, um, we find the islands. Um, there could be one or, as you can see here, many, many different islands. In the center, this ring encloses a lagoon. And really, these three subsystems or these three components together make up what I'd define as the whole atoll. And these atolls, they come in quite a, diff uh, quite a variety in a, uh, in a diversity um, of, of appearances. We can have atolls that are essentially a completely closed island ring here to the left. Um, we can have atolls where the coral reefs are continuous but we have sort of the, um, the islands or the landforms separated by channels. The coral reefs can also be separated in itself. Um, so we have these large channels. And there's actually, in, at least in parts of the Pacific, a situation where these whole structures are somewhat tilted and they appear more like lines. But if we have this satellite look on them, we can still see the general um, atoll morphology. And even though we sometimes think of these atolls as a very odd and rare and maybe exotic, even though I don't like the word, um, ecosystem, they're actually quite widespread. Um, and if we map out all the oceanic islands across the Indo-Pacific, we realize that about a third of the Indo-Pacific islands that we have are atolls. And in regions like Polynesia, but also the Western Indian Ocean, atolls actually make up the most common and the most dominant uh, island type, at least by numbers. Um, and these uh, atolls, as you may or may not know, um, they are sort of related in their evolution to, vol uh, to volcanoes, which was originally proposed by Darwin as a Darwin subsidence model. So he described the sinking uh, of the volcano um, and then the formation of coral reefs around these volcanoes that continue to grow upward, whereas the vol volcano cooled, increases in density and slowly sinks. But what I really want to emphasize uh, in Darwin's subsidence model, that it's also describing, in a way, a transformation process. A volcano um, is a geologic, a basaltic rock structure, inanimate rock. Um, but the, the coral reef and the atoll towards the right side of this end is really a biogenic structure. The whole coral reef is a life ecosystem that continues to grow upward. And I say this a bit provocatively, uh, but a, a volcanic island is really mostly inanimate rock with a little bit of biofilm on top of it, whereas the atoll in itself is a biogenic structure. And what's also missing in this, in this depiction of Darwin's subsidence model is the time scale that we're looking at here. Because um, it, it, it sort of creates the illusion that it's a very linear process and the atolls are sort of the penultimate stage uh, shortly before these islands disappear. But some of these atolls, not all, but some of these atolls have been around for many million years and if we sort of accept that these atolls are in a way a biogenic structure, a life ecosystem, 
um, they're actually among the world's oldest living ecosystems. So uh, atolls like any wet hog or, or the Maldives, they're dated back as far as 50 million years ago. And I think, I mean, this is, of course, this is not a pinpoint accurate, but by the order of mag magnitude, uh, Amazon rainforest is dated at around 55 million years. So if you're not yet convinced that these uh, atolls should be thought of as, as large living ecosystems, I hope I can change this throughout the talk. Um, I want to emphasize here, this is really very old structures that we're, that we're finding in the, in the tropical oceans. Um, but what's also overlooked, and I think what's quite important um, to really understand the biogeography and the ecology of atolls, um, is that this depiction of Darwin's model creates a sort of false linearity or an image of a false linearity, suggesting that it just goes from the volcano to the atoll and then the atoll drowns and disappears. So, to start with, I really want to um, go through the, the geoecological history and sort of revisit the, it in a bit more detail because I think it's important to understand uh, a lot of the properties and processes that we find on atolls. And obviously what's quite important um, when, we, when we really want to appreciate the history of, of atolls, it's a low-lying structure. So the sea level fluctuations over the millions of years or even just in the last 500,000 of years, they obviously become extremely important to understand what's going on on these atolls. And you probably know that just in the last 500,000 years, we had these Brunner cycles where sea, with the glacial periods where sea levels uh, rose and dropped by over 100 meters. And this is obviously quite important when we think of atolls and how they behave and how species assembled on these systems. So we had phases of rapid sea level rise where these atoll structures more or less completely um, submerged. The coral reefs remained, but the island sort of got wiped clean and reset. Um, but either, either during phases of receding sea levels or stagnating sea levels, um, the coral reefs were able to catch up with these rapid rising sea levels. Um, and slowly grew upward towards the sea surface. Once the atoll then hits the, or the coral reef sort of hit the sea surface, they transition from a vertical growth to a more horizontal growth and built these extensive reef flat plates. And these reef flat plates are sort of the nucleation sites, the starting sites where the islands uh, formed. And this is the sort of the, the, the configuration that we're seeing atolls today. But obviously over the history or over the, the tens or hundreds of thousands of years, sea levels eventually started to drop again, and these islands, more and, or these, these volcanics, uh, these, these coral reef structures became more and more exposed again until the lagoon completely sealed off and we had, in a way, these large coralline cylinders sticking out, um, of, uh, out of the ocean, sometimes 20, 20, 30, 40 meters in elevation. But because we're speaking here about a, a um, a calcium carbonate structure, they, were very, they are very susceptible to erosion. Um, so during these phases of sea level low stands, um, these basaltic cylinder structures, in a way these, these Makatea type islands named after Makatea in, the, uh, in, in Polynesia, they eroded quite a bit by several meters, uh, up to 10, 20 meters over these low stand cycles. And eventually the sea level rise also caught up with the next um, deglaciation uh, period and the atoll um, eventually submerged again. And if I bring back these sea level curves just uh, over the last 500,000 years, you're seeing that these, these curves, these, these cycles or these, these periods of sea level rise and sea levels falls didn't just happen once. So the process that we're really describing here is a circular process in which these atolls, um, these atolls move through between being sub submerged, um, reappearing, becoming these high standing structures and then eventually slowly um, disappearing again. Um, so these atolls really persist in these geoecological cycles between being exposed, entirely submerged, um, or just being in this rim configuration that we're having. Another important feature that becomes clear when we appreciate this history is that the atoll islands that we're seeing today are extremely young. And I'm gonna talk about this in a, in a little bit of, in a bit more detail. We also need to appreciate that atoll islands are really just these low lying deposits that sit on these uh, reef flat plates. And I already teased this a little bit, um, the atolls, I think we really need to think of them as large biogenic structures. And so for the next uh, part of my talk, I wanna go through these, these, these features of atolls and really show how important they are to appreciate them and acknowledge them um, to really understand the system. So when I say atolls persist in these geoecological cycles, sure we have the evidence of sea level rise and sea level falls, but what can we say about 
the ecology, the biology or the biogeography, when these atolls um, are basically re um, repeatedly reset in their, in their species assembly. So is, do we have any evidence of what I would maybe call the ghost of past emergences? Um, well, we do, especially in the 1960s and 1970s, um, research groups drilled very deep into the um, carbonate soils of atolls, and they were able to extract ancient pollen from as old as 5 million years ago um, from these, um, from these um, um, deep layers of, um, of the atoll. And what they found there um, in terms of plant communities are, is, is quite remarkable in a way that these are also the plant species that we're finding today on atolls. Um, but I mean, on the other hand, you could also argue, sure, I mean, maybe the, the pool of colonization is just very limited. So it's not that surprising that always the same uh, species seem to have colonized these atolls, despite these um, repeated um, ecological resets that the islands experienced. Well, we have also some evidence from uh, land snails. And again, what we're finding in several land snail groups uh, on, an, on an atoll is essentially the colonization of the same set of land snail species in the last three emergence cycles. So these land snails must have colonized the atoll. The atoll eventually submerged, got reset ecologically, reappeared, and the same set of species seem to have colonized again. An even more uh, impressive example is the Aldabra atoll giant tortoise. Again, for this uh, giant tortoise, we have bone records that show that this species must have colonized Aldabra atoll, which is in the Seychelles, at least three times in these last emergence and submergence cycles. To me, the most f fascinating story of repeated colonization, and not just repeated colonization, is the case of the Aldabra atoll rail. This is, as the name suggests, an endemic rail, sometimes considered endemic species, sometimes considered endemic subspecies, um, that occurs on Aldabra Atoll. And this bird colonized Aldabra Atoll in the Pleistocene from Madagascar, where it still has maintains a volant, like a flight able um, um, population. It colonized Aldabra Atoll um, and it did what every rail does um, or most rails do when they reach an, an, an island. They, it will evolve towards flightlessness. But about 130,000 years ago, Aldabra completely submerged and this bird went extinct on Aldabra. But after Aldabra re-emerged about 120,000 years ago, the same rail from Madagascar colonized Aldabra again and again uh, evolved on a trajectory towards flightlessness. So these are the bone records um, from the extant species and this is the bone record uh, from, from the Pleistocene species. So a, a very unique so far, but a fascinating system to think about uh, repeated colonization or even evolutionary trajectories that atolls, I think atoll islands offer um, offer a, a window to study in. And in, in, a, in a broader sense, there's, there's this ongoing debate between contingency and predictability. On the one hand, um, arguments that saying life, life, the history of life is dependent on the series of, of events that took place until that moment. Um, the pred predictability argument saying universal chemical and physical laws determine very similar best fit solutions under the same environmental conditions. And I mean, I'm not saying that at atolls were, are perfectly making a, a case for one, one, one side or the other, but I think it's just, I, I just like to think about what atolls and uh, these, these um, paleontological records um, suggest about evolutionary trajectories. So atolls persist in these, in these cycles and at least what we, from the data that we have, it appears that the assembly and evolution over these cycles um, is at least non-random. That's how far I would go um, to say here. The second point that I want to talk about is that atolls are extremely young islands. Um, so if I zoom in a little bit more in the sea level curve, um, this is just the last 20,000 years, we had, a rapid, we had a phase of rapid sea level rise, which in, essentially um, submerged most atolls um, that we have. And only in the last, somewhere between 10,000 years, the atolls caught up in their, um, caught up, uh, in their coral reef growth. And actually most of the atoll islands that we find today are somewhere between one to 7,000 years old. So atoll islands are by several orders of magnitude, the youngest, at least oceanic island ecosystems that we have in the world. And just to put this into perspective, um, Gubekli Tepe, one of the oldest known human structures about 10,000 years old. So humans were already building or forming societies and building, building sort of very an ancient um, structures when most of the atolls were still not around. So just, as an, just to think about how young these uh, atoll islands are that we're seeing. 
And for the biogeographers um, that, or for if you have some biogeography thinking, I mean, atoll, atolls are often explained to be very low in species because they're sort of positioned here towards the end of the general dynamic model. But I would argue we should rather put the atolls here at the beginning. They're just, they're just emerged. They're just a few thousand years old. So obviously um, there can't be much speciation or, um, or, or more, more, yeah, more, more complex um, life communities existing. So, so sort of atolls seem to be this uh, super tramps paradise. And this is what we're finding in the, in the communities, whether it's plants, insects, um, um, or, or, or larger vertebrate groups. Um, but I began compiling a large data set uh, on atoll species communities. And what I begin to realize is that there's actually quite a lot of endemic subspecies on these atolls, uh, uh, on, on the islands, which to me suggests, and there, there should be a big question mark here, that um, atolls are really at, at the beginning of a very early subspeciation process, at least in some of these species groups. Um, but I mean, a, apart from, from this observation that we're having these um, these, these endemic subspecies on atolls, there hasn't, this hasn't been much, much recognized. Um, but sort of for, for, for this hypothesis that maybe it's the time, not the, uni that the, uni that not the uniformity that restrict the atoll speciation, I think an interesting argument comes from Aldabra Atoll. Aldabra Atoll is slightly uplifted, six to eight meters, so it escaped the Holocene um, sort of ecological reset, the Holocene submergence. So Aldabra Atoll is not just one or, one or few thousand years old. Aldabra Atoll's islands are about 120,000 years old. And if we look at the species communities there, we see that this, uh, there's about 43% single, single island endemism in the spiders. And this goes throughout the different, um, throughout the different uh, species groups there. Um, so this is sort of, this is sort of what, what I'm, I'm quite excited about. Um, to, to, to start looking into in, in more detail over the next years um, with a colleague from Naturalis is we want to sort of, with very powerful um, um, evolutionary models, we want, we want to better understand what the trajectory of, of speciation on, on these atolls is if we consider that they're sort of cycling through the, these periods and the land areas are con uh, contracting and expanding. So this is what's quite, quite by geography um, dependent. Oh. But I now want to uh, focus and look a little bit um, um, on, the, on this fact that these islands are really just low-lying deposits. And what I want to do with you is essentially just take a slice through, what, through, through such an atoll island. And if, we, and if we cut through an atoll island like this, um, we really see that these, uh, these islands, these sediment deposits, they just sit on this con consolidated layer of the reflat plate or of the more of the, these Pleistocene structure. And there is some, some sonation also there, which I'm not going into. But what I, what I really want to argue that these are really just um, unconsolidated um, sediment deposits that more or less sit there. And that makes these islands very dynamic, naturally very dynamic systems. There's a, a series of fantastic studies by my colleague Paul Kent from Singapore University who studied the dynamism of these atoll islands. Um, and he really shows that these islands are wandering. They're moving around um, over the reflat plate and constantly adjusting um, their size and, and position in relation to ocean, oceanographic uh, forcing. But they're not just on a random path movement, these islands. These islands are also, in, at least in areas where we have strong seasonality and predictable seasonality, these islands are also quite predictably bouncing back and forth. So in the Maldives, for example, we have a very pronounced east um, and, and west monsoon. And if we would look for, uh, on an island from January to January, it would appear relatively stable. But over one season, this island sh can shift by 20, 30, sometimes 40 meters back and forth um, by the forcing of the different predominant wind and wave directions. So these islands are also in a way bouncing, at least if we have these very strong seasonal effects. Even more important though, is that the nature of these atoll islands is the nature of growing. And tracking many satellite images, we're seeing that the, these atoll islands are growing in accreting sediment and many islands that for example, got hit by, by a massive cyclone, um, continue to aggregate sediment and, and continue to grow. Um, and I wanna look a bit more into detail um, into this process, how to grow an atoll island. Um, this is obviously a very complex um, um, biophysical process, but I want to uh, emphasize three elements here um, that we have, and this is cyclones, the corals and the forest. 
The corals sort of generate the sediments that we have that built these islands, but we often need these high energy events to move the sediments from the coral reef onto these nucleation or these deposition sites. Um, and the forests are playing a quite an important role in trapping these sediments. Um, so even though that we think often as cyclones is a very erosive or a de destructive force, what we're finding uh, for, for, for at least under certain conditions on atolls is that after hur hurricane events are actually pulsing a lot of sediments onto these islands or towards these islands um, and allow the island form to grow. And the important role of the forest is not really recognized so far. There's one fantastic study done by um, David Stoddard, who's one of the legends in, in atoll ecology. Um, and he tracked the cyclone impact of an atoll um, and showed that the islands of the atoll that had a very stratified um, native vegetation, after the cyclone hit this atoll, um, the forest there was able to bind and trap the sediment. And after the cyclone had passed, the islands with the native stratified vegetation had grown by up to 1.5 meters vertically. The, uh, in the same atoll, the islands that were either completely deforested um, or were turned into these mono, monoculture coconut plantations, these were these islands that suffered severe erosion. So it's really this, it seems to be this interplay between the, the corals, but also the forest to bind the sediments and help this growing process of, of these islands. And if you would dig into the ground of an atoll, and unfortunately, this is really only the best image that there is in the, in the literature. Um, these islands sort of have growth rings because we have these periods of overwash when sediments are getting deposited on these islands. And then we have periods of relative stability when soil starts to build up until eventually, sooner or later, the next cyclone or high energy event deposits the next layer of coralline sediments. And then uh, soil builds up. So we're seeing in these, in these soil pro profiles, we're often seeing um, these layers of buried soil and coral deposits stacked on top of each other that's in a, in a way document the growing of these atoll islands. So atoll islands are very low-lying and dynamic systems. Um, and even on the scale of a single atoll, we are experiencing that the different atolls relative in, the, relative in their position um, to these dominant forces can be um, quite differently affected. Um, and that makes also the terrestrial communities on, uh, on these atolls uh, very dynamic. So rather than thinking, these atoll islands are often presented as being, um, as being always the replicas of the same community, but we're, depending on the exposure of, uh, of the island and the relative position of these islands, we're seeing different uh, assembly points um, of the community um, that are either always trapped in a very early succession stage because this island gets overwashed every few years, whereas other islands within the atoll um, are possible to achieve higher, um, a, a higher uh, succession. And we sort of showed this in a, in a global study where we tracked the species turnover within atolls and we can show that the atolls that experience higher cyclone impacts are also the atolls that are more dissimilar in their species community between the different islands. Um, so it just really shows how important these, um, these high energy events not only are for the geosphere part, but also for the assembly of the biosphere part. The last talking point um, about atolls is that these are really biogenic structures, which I already teased it a little bit. So atolls can be these impressively vibrant life ecosystems. Um, but we often fail to really acknowledge that at the right scale because we're so obsessed by either the island or either the corals or um, one part. But I think Francis Rogeri put it very nice. He said, the atoll is the singularity within the oceanic tropical desert. And what he means by this, we really need to look at the whole structure um, as a, as a, um, and, and, and really understand the, the connection of the whole structure to appreciate how these systems come about. And seabirds are playing an important role in that, um, that when we start with an island, uh, a barren island, there's, it's just calcium carbonate sediments. So there's, there's no nutrients, there's no minerals there except for calcium carbonate and a little bit of magnesium. So these seabirds are really important as catalyzers to the uh, carbon sequestration. But it's not just the seabird, it's also the forest themselves that are not just the passive receivers of, um, um, of these, uh, of these nutrients, but they also contribute in actively enriching 
um, the, um, the atolls. And a very important, or probably the most important atoll plant is Pisonia grandis. This is a fantastic Pisonia tree over four meters in diam diameter that I photographed a couple of weeks ago in the Maldives. And there's a, uh, there's a very peculiar phenomenon on, uh, on, with atoll forests is that in many settings, atoll forests tend to converge towards monodominance, monodominance of Pisonia, um, Pisonia forests, which I think in itself is quite remarkable. Most tropical forests converge to, in their maturity to a very diverse setting, but on these atolls, there seems to be this conversion towards uh, Pisonia monodominance. And these Pisonia forests, they interact in a very fascinating way with these seabirds. These seabirds bring in uh, large amounts of nutrients in the form of guano, night bird poop, essentially. Um, and these, but the, the, the sort of the issue that we're having is that because we're ju just having a calcium carbonate sediment, the soil is very alkaline. So particularly the phosphorus is sort of locked um, away and can't really enrich the soil. And this is where the Pisonia comes into play because Pisonia leaves are extremely acidic. So what Pisonia does or the, these Pisonia forests do is they lower the soil pH to a degree that the phosphorus can be leached out of the guano and enrich the underlying soil um, with, with phosphorus. But as the phosphorus or the guano percolates into deeper layers, the pH increases um, until the phosphorus uh, remineralizes and forms these apatite layers. And this is a specific rock formation that is actually called atoll phosphate rock um, that is formed very, that is probably formed through this interplay of, of seabirds and these Pisonia forests. And we're sort of seeing this in some, some studies that looked at the soils um, of atolls that even, in, if, even if we have a native forest like a pandanus, the phosphorus enrichment is really located or concentrated to the areas where we have not only the seabirds, but these Pisonia forests. But as I said, these atolls are connected systems, so it's obviously not stopping here. Um, we're seeing an enrichment in these native forests where we have lots of forests and also Pisonia. We, we're seeing an enrichment of the groundwater lands as well with nitrogen and phosphorus. And the, the, the groundwater lens is in a very um, constant exchange um, with the lagoon. It's quite important. There's no groundwater discharge towards the ocean side of most uh, atolls. It's only going to the lagoon side. So that's quite important when we, when we want to understand the larger energy and, and nutrient flows. Um, so the groundwater discharge is essentially during high tides or during swells, the groundwater lens nags a little, uh, the, 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 the lagoon water nags a little bit away from the groundwater lens and pulls these nutrient into, into the lagoon environment. And in these lagoons, um, we're meeting a phenomenon that's called lagoon pumping or atoll flushing. Um, because atoll form these rings, they're relatively sheltered towards the open ocean. And what that means is that when we have pronounced tidal cycles, um, the water levels, the tidal water levels rise and fall faster outside the atoll than inside. So after the high tide, the, the water levels drop faster outside the atoll than inside. And what happens is therefore we have a very directed outward flow of this lagoon enriched water across the reef crest um, into the nearshore pelagic environment. And the opposite then happens when the, sea, uh, when the water levels start to rise again with rising tides. The tides rise faster, out, the water level rises faster outside um, the atoll than, than inside. So we're getting this inward directed flow of water again across the reef crest. And obviously the amount of water that is getting pumped or flushed um, depends highly on the, on the openness or the closeness of the lagoon. Um, and, of, and on the volume, but still there's large amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and other compounds get pumped in and out of the atoll. And some, some authors uh, actually call this the breathing of the atoll, which I think is a, a quite a, a imaginative but nice, nice picture to imagine how these atolls pump, um, pump water across the reef crest. And what we're, experiencing, what we're observing outside the atoll is a phenomenon called the island mass effect, although I want to argue that we should call it very specifically the atoll mass effect. So we are getting upwelling around most oceanic islands of deep sea and nutrient enriched deep sea waters that, that gets upwelled on the outside um, of the atoll and already lead, leads to some enrichment of the nearshore environment. But this upwelled water in the, in the situation of atolls then also meets these further enriched nutrients that get flushed, that get pumped out of the lagoon and they create um, a highly productive uh, nearshore environment. This is sort of, um, and some, some, sometimes quantified by 130% increase in nutrients. 
And we, in false, false color images, we can really see this, this enrichment. This is the Maldivian, Maldivian atoll uh, chain. And we're seeing here, at least during parts of the season, um, that massive upwelling e events lead to this uh, bloom and enrichment in chlorophyll around, these, uh, around the Maldivian atolls. The most peculiar phenomenon of, of atolls and the energy flows is that there's not only just a, an upwelling or an upwelling outside the atoll, but we're also having what's called an endo upwelling. This is a phenomenon that's poorly understood and probably not that relevant, but I think it's, it's definitely occurring uh, and quite interesting. So deep sea oceanic waters at, a, at somewhere around 800 to 1200 meters depth enters this porous carbon limestone of atolls and gets also upwelled internally through the limestone structure and then exits um, the atoll at the surface. And as I said, it's very contested how much this really contributes to, um, to the significance of the energy flows, but it's a very fascinating system. And you probably, or you may or may not know that in, on a lot of atolls, we have these freshwater or brackish water lakes where we find stromatolites. These very ancient life forms are quite dominant in, the, in these systems. And these stromatolites, they have been identified as one of these uh, recipients of these uh, endo upwelling processes. Again, are they absolutely dependent on it? Hard to say, probably not. Um, so pulling all this together, and this is a preliminary figure, I'm still working with the illustrator, so, um, Apologies for that, but pulling all that together, I really want to argue that we have to approach these atolls as these integrated, also transboundary systems where energy and nutrient flows are crossing so many times the, these classic boundaries that most of us have in our head between terrestrial and marine or uh, photic zone and, and, and deep water zone. So we have the upwelling, we have the process of these seabirds um, and then the flushing of the atoll. So, so far, or in the first part of this talk, so far I have argued um, how these atolls are uh, sort of a fascinating ecosystem in itself, um, whether, whether or not you're convinced by that. Um, but what is their wider place in the biosphere? What's the role of the atolls in the, in the wider biosphere, at least in the Indo-Pacific Indo scale? So we've, we've, we've done a global study um, where, we, where, we simu or where we predicted and uh, calculated the, the global seabird populations that are nesting on all the atolls. Um, of the Indo-Pacific, and what we found is that, uh, or what, what, we, what we realize if we add up the seabird uh, colonies on all the Indo-Pacific islands, is that um, there's more seabirds on the 280 atolls than there are in all of Europe, and then uh, there's also more seabirds um, than there are seabirds in all of South America. So these tropical, these tropical atolls, even though they're not species rich, they're, for these tropical seabirds, they are a hotspot of global significance with over 31 million seabirds uh, on, these, on these atolls. And obviously, as I already argued, these seabirds are very important nutrient pumps. So related to, to, to this concentration of seabirds on these tiny speckles of land across the Indo-Pacific, they are probably very important um, uh, as nutrient delivery systems and for the ammonia emissions. And after all, we simulated in this study also the foraging ranges and show that these, these uh, seabirds forage over vast areas around of atolls. So they highly concentrate and focus nutrients on the atoll environment. Also in, a, in, a, in, a, in another project that I'm currently working on, we, we started to simulate the movement um, of, of animals or of, no, not, not just animals, of species across the Indo-Pacific um, islandscape. Uh, and we're sort of assessing and measuring how important are atolls as wider stepping stones for the colonization and also for maintaining the connectivity be between populations. And this is an ongoing project that we're still working on, um, but it, it, oh, sorry, it already seems um, as if um, atolls are quite important in maintaining for some species groups um, the wider connectivity across, across the Indo-Pacific because oftentimes these high islands, volcanic islands, they form these isolated clusters, but we have these long chains of atolls that are probably quite important stepping stones. Maybe not today when, when these islands are in these uh, low-lying ring configurations, but if we think in larger evolutionary scales, when these islands are exposed uh, during sea level low stands, they have huge land areas. The entire lagoon becomes land. So at that time, they probably become, um, or during these phases, they probably become quite important stepping stones. I'm not going too much into detail um, to that, but I also want to emphasize, of course, that atolls also carry a unique cultural heritage. Um, there's many indigenous cultures um, uh, on atolls, atoll, whole atoll nations. Even the word atoll 
itself comes from the Divehi word. Divehi is the language spoken in the Maldives. Um, so even the word atoll itself is de derived um, directly um, from, from, a, from a traditional um, um, uh, atoll culture, uh, human, human culture. And these uh, obviously carry very fascinating and unique um, yeah, um, knowledge about these systems because they essentially co-evolved. So turning a little bit more now away from, from the ecology into the, into the future and approach uh, to atolls in the future, I think it's quite problematic actually the way we think about the system because it seems like our debate, our approach to atolls is mostly bound in this doom and gloom narrative. And colleagues, um, John Barnett um, and, and Jerry Lill, they, they put together uh, sort of a, a buzzword analysis of, of how atolls are, are being framed. And we can see about that it's mostly about uh, migration and their sort of the, the, the reduction to their smallness, which I think is not doing justice um, to these atolls or systems. Um, there's also quite a problematic um, dynamic in there, I think, um, that sort of all that we discuss is whether we translocate the population on atolls to country A, B, or C. So this is, but this is largely where we're we bound in our discussion or our approach uh, of atolls in the future. Um, so in a way, these atolls, and we, we in, and I, I want to argue, or we, we argue in, in this article here is they're sort of, sort of became in a way the canary bird um, for a lot of climate change models. Whenever we want to say how, how devastating climate change impact would, it seems quite handy to have the atolls and refer that these atolls will be gone uh, at a certain number of time or after a certain um, amount of sea level rise. Um, so what we argue, um, or what I want to argue or in, this, in, this, in this group of authors, we sort of propose a rethinking of these atolls. And we, we argue that there are place and nature-based opportunities for atolls to build local resilience. And the key to unlock these place and nature-based opportunities for atolls partly lies in what I just presented to you. They're not small islands. We shouldn't just reduce them to their smallness. We need to recognize atolls as these large transboundary system, uh, systems that integrate the marine, that integrate the freshwater, and they integrate these terrestrial uh, subsystems in this large uh, ecosystem in itself. And we also need to recognize atolls as these biogenic structures. The nature of an atoll is the nature of growing, not one of, of, uh, of eroding. And what we're sort of arguing is that um, there, there are these three components to the atoll um, that we need to that 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 we need to maintain or that we need to study. That is, th sort of the coral reefs are serving as the sediment factory that produces the sediments uh, for the islands. Um, we need the open connections, sort of the conveyor belt of the sediments from the reefs to the islands, and then the islands themselves also need to be in a state that they can hold and trap and bind these sediments. And of course, climate change is a major issue there. Um, with um, ocean warming, ocean acidification, damaging these impacts. But we're, we're sort of overlooking that in, in this debate that there's a lot of local scale impacts that are much more um, manageable on a, on, a, on a local scale with local communities that also contrib contrib contribute to the stability or to the erosion of these atoll islands. And even, even if, I, I mean, even if, even if we, without sea level rise, if, if the coral reefs are entirely destroyed, these islands completely denuded, they're also transitioning probably from away from this accretionary nature to an erosive nature. So we argue that there are a lot of these, these local impacts that we can go to with uh, ecological restoration um, to, to study and understand if that contrib contributes. And I, er, earlier I mentioned um, these, this case study that showed the negative impact that these coconut plantations are apparently had for the stability of, uh, of these islands. So in a, in a recent study that was led by the Nature Conservancy and uh, Mike Burnett from the University of Santa Barbara, we, 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 we mapped out the extent of these copra plantations, these coconut plantations across the Pacific to really understand what's the scale, what's the issue that we're talking here about. And what we found is that about 60, over 60% of the atoll broadleaf forests have been turned into coconut plantations. And what's quite important here to emphasize is that many of these copra plantations um, are no longer actively used. So they just sit there, they're, they're sort of um, locked in, in this ecological state, um, but they're, they're not actively used anymore. And just to put this into perspective, um, it's estimated that about 39% uh, of the Bornean rainforest has been turned into, into crop uh, palm plantations. So just to give you an ex uh, a, a relative reference, what's, what the scale of this, this pond impact is um, for the stability 
um, uh, for yeah for for the wider for the wider atolls. Um, but I think there's a there's there's many exciting opportunities coming in the future to understand more what these uh, crop or these monoculture plantations are doing for the wider stability for atolls. So what what we're really arguing, and I mean, I would love to stand here and give you sort of a a presentation, the 10 golden rules, how to restore natural. I would absolutely love that if we were there, but we're not. Um, so what we are arguing is that we need to under identify now as, as, uh, more as, as researchers, we need to identify where are these interactions between the geosphere and the biosphere of the atoll? Where are they interacting and where are the opportunities that we can go in to restore biosphere processes that then cascade towards these geospherical processes? So this is sort of the, 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 the way I think how we can unlock these place-based management opportunities. And this is not to say that reducing greenhouse gas emissions and lowering these global impacts of um, climate change is absolutely essential, but there's much more that we can do also on a local scale. For now, mostly from the research perspective, but hopefully we're getting there to really understand the ecological benefits that then can translate from research to action. So to slowly come to an end um, with this presentation, I really want to emphasize or present to you this rethinking of atolls. Atolls are these integrated transboundary biogenic systems that need to be stewarded by the local communities and not just simply surrendered to climate change. And I haven't spoken much about it, but I think traditional ecological knowledge, and I'm happy afterwards to speak a little bit more about that, I think is, a, is a, an important key to unlock a more systems integrating approach to atolls. And I want to end this presentation with a slightly more, more, more colorful image, maybe to, to stimulate your, your, your rethinking about atolls. The oceanographer Isaacs uh, wrote in his opening remarks um, of, his, of, of his book, uh, he, he essentially asked, why are there no pelagic forests in the ocean? One can easily compute the advantages such a tree would enjoy with its canopy near the surface and the lighted levels and its trunk and roots extending down to the nutrient rich waters under the mixed layer. Well, what I'm sort of suggesting is maybe these pelagic forests exists. We just gave them a different name and really didn't recognize them as such so far. Thank you. Any questions? Fantastic imagery, as always. Uh, okay, we can open up to questions. Let me. I can pop up people thinking. You mentioned uh, the uh, sea level uh, rise and I'm able to to accommodate that. What are did, is there an idea on the limits? What rates of sea level rise prove is too challenging even for fully flourishing biogenic atolls? Mm, that's a good question. I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, there's there's so many factors coming in because when 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 you build these models that lead to higher sea level rise then uh, related to that is higher sea, uh, sea surface temperatures so that always, always then cascades into the coral reefs so i'm not sure if i'm not aware that there's the, this clear cut where we're saying yes or no thumb up and down to what degree it, um, uh, it's possible mm -hmm. yeah okay okay I don't know the next question. I always hide in the corner of the room. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian, for the presentation. Very, very, very good. Ah? Uh, 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 oh, sorry about this. Um, so, um, thank you very much for the presentation. Wonderful job and uh, uh, incredibly sensitive ecosystems. Is fantastic. Uh, yes. So the. I'm, I'm not so sure it's, it's so much about the question. So my entire background is about risk and um, on multiple uh, multiple facets of risk. And now you've been mentioning, now you told this fantastic, you beautiful story of the geological evolution of these um, of these environments. They are almost like a nature gift uh, for us. And they're so they're like a little jewels in the ocean that we could celebrate, but they also so incredibly fragile so um what i and all on the scale of pre-human it does look like the the system itself will survive it's just how we gonna um celebrate that in our life as humans and for how long and in what form that depends on our own action 
And um, when you touched on the local scale of response to what is to come from the uh, climate perspective, it made me immediately think about the the amount of work that could be put into looking into the vulnerability dimension of that risk. So we, we understand where they are, we understand what they are, we understand climatically, I could I, find me after we could talk about the sea level rise and the risk. I could, I could even give you projections and all sorts of them. Um, but it's the vulnerability that always remains like a big open question. So it's a local vulnerability of the community that can be there and also the ecosystem itself. So I was just wondering if you want to put a, a little bit more weight and strength in that in these couple of slides that can cover that aspect a little bit uh, more, because that's ultimately where the response and adaptation of these systems will be hiding. And sorry about long question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure if I understand. So the, the vulnerability of local communities. And the system itself. So the vulnerability of the atolls. Like how would you how would you define it? And which dimensions of vulnerability would you put more um, weight and uh, emphasis on? I mean, essentially, the, the coral reefs, because um, they built the, the fundament uh, of the whole system and, and main, they sort of they generate the sediments of the islands. Um, they are the structural framework. So the, the coral, coral reefs are, are certainly, um, if we trace it down, the, 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 the core point where, where, where the vulnerability of these, these systems sits. Uh, 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 yeah, if, if that answers your question. Okay. 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 Thank you. Very nice talk. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, you, you've placed a lot of emphasis on the importance of seabirds, correctly. Mm -hmm. you've placed a lot of emphasis on the importance of seabirds bringing nutrients onto the islands and mm -hmm. being distributed throughout the atoll ecosystem. Uh, are you giving consideration also to dolphins, particularly spinner dolphins, which import uh, probably comparable levels of, of nutrients into the atoll lagoon? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we, it's, it's, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So. The seabirds are not the cause for high productivity, they're symptoms of high productivity. And in the same way, other marine megafauna that is, uh, that is using high up, upwelling events or, or, or enriched waters, they, they could also con contribute. And I, and I know about a study from Palmyra that also showed that the, the pelagic sharks um, are also important nutrient delivery systems into these atolls. For many other species, I'm not aware that it has been quantified. Um, but I think every, everything mobile that's connecting these productive areas with the nearshore environment has the potential to transport nutrients at relevant scales or at, at relevant amounts into the atoll environment. Absolutely. I'm sort of slightly is, is there evidence that the, the, the flux of dolphins or sharks is as large as the species? I don't have precise. That's okay. Yeah, I don't know how precise the, the comparison is, uh, but the atoll behind you, uh, the, the odd shaped one, the L shaped one, Varva Toll, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Maldives, that has the longest reef in the Maldives, uh, and spinner dolphins, which occur in large numbers around um, atolls throughout the Indo Pacific, uh, migrate on a daily basis in and out of, of the atolls. And Varva Toll, I mentioned, because they, they can pass through the channels, they don't go over the reef flat, of course, mm -hmm. they go through the, the reef channels. Uh, and where you have a long reef, fewer channels, they get concentrated there. So, so very large numbers of spinner dolphins passing in and out uh, mm. through these particular channels on a, on a daily basis. They feed at night offshore uh, in the mesopelagic boundary layer, uh, which is a, a, a symptom of, of the island mass effect, the atoll mass effect. Uh, and in the case of the Maldives, with the seasonally um, alternating monsoon winds driving seasonally oscillating monsoon currents, uh, brings clear oceanic water to the upstream side of the Maldives. Mm. Uh, and because of the solar radiation, the upper layer is heated, it's stra stratified, so it sits on top of the, the deep nutrient-rich water. But when it hits this brick wall of the Maldives, you get upwelling, bringing nutrients to the surface. So the, a physical process, mm -hmm. uh, bringing nutrients to the surface, which drives the plankton bloom, phytoplankton bloom, as we saw on the downstream side. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the seabirds and, and the other megafauna exploiting this and returning those nutrients um, to the mm. atoll 
uh, lagoon. So uh, many, many things going on. It's, it's, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's a dynamic, yeah. complex process, but um, and seabirds very important. Uh, just but, pointing yeah. out the other. Ah, absolutely, absolutely. Other parts yeah. of the system as well. Seabirds are, I think, just in their deposition rates, and they're just a bit, bit more easy to quantify than than the than the dolphins. But I, um, I'd absolutely agree that this is an, probably also an important connector or delivery system into the atolls. Yeah. Thanks. Could you say more about sand keys and why they're stuck in a relatively early successional state? Are they sinking faster or more recently exposed? And are they as resilient as uh, true atolls to uh, sea level rise? So, sorry, which? Sand keys, sand keys. Ah. Things like Bramble K. Yeah. Um... No, I can't say. I can't. I can't say much about them. This is a. It's an interesting question to think about because we always, or we oftentimes lump all these reef islands together in the in the same category. If we really pull together this this atoll metabolism, it really suggests that having a lagoon is quite important to have this nearshore productivity. But I don't think anyone had looked what having a lagoon in the in the case of a proper atoll does to the larger energy fluxes compared to just having the, these Ks that, that exist without these. Um, so it's, it's an interesting question that I also thought about, but that I'm not aware of has been, has been disentangled or looked at. That was, that was really nice. So I was just wondering when you said, um, and I, I know that, 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 that adults are, <clears throat> Are really well connected they're connected systems which is just so interesting in itself but i was just wondering about the it, the levels of endemism and at what scale you get endemism and amongst which groups and why mm -hmm. and is it anagenesis cladogenesis and um and also whether at the same kind of the the flip side of that to what you know what are the patterns of invasion on on the island mm -hmm. sorry that was a lot mm -hmm. Uh, so in terms of the endemism, um, we're getting both. Um, we definitely, so it, it seems to be biased towards the atolls that escape the Holocene um, submergence. So we have endemic species in the in the Kiribati, um, on Kiri, Kiri, Kiribati Atoll, which is, has probably escaped the Holocene um, submergence, the Holocene reset, we have it on Aldabra. So these systems, um, and from, from the genetics studies that exist suggest that this is really, um, in internal speciation. We're also having situations like the, the Laysan duck and Laysan, Laysan atoll that by now I think is, is we're, we're quite confident that there's bone records of this species also in the high islands um, where it went extinct, but it sort of survived there. So we, we're getting both. Um, the bias definitely seems to, for full species and endemism seems to be on these atolls that escaped the Holocene that are about 120,000 years old, um, not just a few thousand. But then still we're also seeing um, on, on atolls like even Cocos Keeling or the Maldives. Um, um, and yeah, we're, we're also seeing the, these endemic subspecies there. Um, and I can't comment much on this now, but I'm still pulling together this, but together with Luis Valente, um, we want to use the DAISY model to sort of look into, um, look into these processes. In terms of invasive species, I mean, it's the, 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 common, the common ones, invasive rats, um, particularly most atolls have been turned. I mean, atolls have bright, quite a brutal history from being turned into copra plantations, wearing, being sites of nuclear testing. Um, not all, of course. Um, and I think um, a lot of them, in the spe specifically in the Pacific, were turned into military bases. So um, humans have been, have been bringing, I would say, the, the, the classic in, invasives, yellow crazy ants, rats, um, certain weeds. Hello, thank, thank you so much for your incredible talk. I work uh, with seabirds in the Atlantic, so a little bit. Awesome. But in Brazil, where I work with seabirds in Oceanic Islands, we have only one auto, which is Rock Hawkers auto. Yeah. And my question is uh, regarding the sensitivity of autos uh, related to their age, like geological age. Mm -hmm. uh, the younger the, the auto, more sensitive it would be for climate change and sea level rise. I, I, I would like to, to understand a little bit about that because mm -hmm. we don't have forests in Rocas Atto, for example. Mm -hmm. is, does it make, uh, probably it's a really recent auto because it doesn't have endemic um, species, no forest. And is it more, more prone to be impacted by... by, by mm. Ocean level. Mm -hmm. So question. I mean, thank you. Yeah. So there's there's one of there, there's one of the major drivers um, for for 
species diversity on atolls uh, seems to be rainfall, and we're having very uh, pronounced rainfall gradients um, on these on these atolls. Um, so I would assume very arid atolls, and I'm not sure if that's the case for for rockers. Um, but they just the, the the water lens is generally quite small, so there, there might just not be enough water um, to sustain these systems. Like I said, I'd, yeah. Um, so I think that that that's probably a contrib contributor there um, for 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 rockers, without knowing much more details about the 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 biogeography, so to say. I'm very intrigued by this formulation of these as that it is bioecological systems. Well, we've, we've talked mm. to uh, biogeological systems. We've talked quite a lot of, about that. And I wonder how more widespread these examples are in the natural world. Mm. The atoll is a nice example of a relatively self-contained system where you can mm. see this interaction between a biogenic system building on top of a geological one and then the two still working, mm -hmm. being maintained by this flow of nutrients and sediments between the mm -hmm. two. Uh, and there's a, is this... An interesting case study in itself, or does it have wider lessons for islands other other ecosystems? That's a good question. I mean, there are there are islands that are built, I think, around Florida that are built by snail shells. So in a way, it's also like a biogenic structure that or biogenic material like the the corals mm -hmm. um, that built the sediments. Um, in a wider, yeah. So, some islands are. I, I mean, yeah. Not, not, not. I don't know too many other examples, um, but it's it's an interesting, yes, interesting yes. thought. I, I suspect they're out there. We just have to yeah. look at them and their framing, and yeah. things will suddenly pop out. Uh, in that example. Really, I, really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess when, whenever you have a lot of deposition and sort of build up of material, if if, if yes. th there's some analogy to to the atolls in in this, I don't know, could be. Yes, yeah, and there's feedback loops as well. That mm -hmm. okay. Great. Okay. Uh, Thank you. It's absolutely fascinating, and it's always lovely to see such such beautiful imagery as well. Uh, and uh, so we have we have drinks there, so do feel free to linger for some informal uh, conversation as well. So and, and thank you once again, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you.